Hey everybody, Mayor Alan Weber here from City Hall wearing my mask as we start our Friday webcast. Thank you for joining us, Santa Fe. Thank you for being with us. Um, we're gonna do this in a couple parts today, a little different. Uh, start with a special guest, Miranda Viscoli. My friend uh, Miranda is the co-president of uh, New Mexicans to Prevent Gun Violence. And uh, in a week where we've seen gun violence in uh, Atlanta and in Boulder, and we're now still trying to make sense out of those senseless acts, I thought uh, getting Miranda to talk with us today about the, uh, the situation in New Mexico, the situation in Santa Fe, where uh, thankfully we haven't had these kinds of hor horrific incidents, but uh, we all know there is no uh, magic uh, immunity. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago coming into the mayor's office and we were getting phone calls from all over the United States because there had been a school shooting in Santa Fe. Turned out it was Santa Fe, Texas that time. Uh, and we called the mayor in Santa Fe to uh, reach out and offer condolences. But since then, we've seen this kind of gun violence all over the country and it's time to talk about it again. So Miranda, thanks for spending some time with, uh, with us today. Um, just tell me, you do this. Uh, this is your passion. You care deeply about preventing gun violence. What do you see happening and uh, where are there opportunities for us to make sure it doesn't happen here if we can prevent it? Oh, thank you, Mayor, for having me on. And um, yeah, I, I, you know, two things. First, we can talk about the, the mass shootings and then about where we are in New Mexico. Um, I'll, be, I'll be honest. I mean, what we do well in this country are mass shootings. What we do well in this country are making sure that we sell assault weapons, which are war tools designed to kill as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. We, we let guns get into unsafe hands, but what we don't do well is make sure that our families and our communities are safe from gun violence. And this will happen again and again and again and again, and more and more lives will be lost and lost. And, you know, I mean, I in Washington, what's gonna happen? Probably nothing. They're looking at closing the gun show loophole. I mean, that is so small, or maybe ghost guns, which would be great, but we you should have, Miranda, explain what a ghost gun is. Not everybody knows that term. Well, ghost guns are, they can literally be made from plastic. They can be printed and they are very untraceable. They're extremely dangerous guns. And that, that ship has sailed. That ship sailed years ago. We had a bill this last session in New Mexico to try to ban them. I do hope that happens at some point. Uh, but to be honest, I, I do think at the federal level, we do need to ban ghost guns. I think at the local level, um, like you were saying earlier, a lot of people say, well, why doesn't Santa Fe do something? Why don't we ban assault weapons? We can't. We have a, the NRA put in a preemption law back in the, I think, early 80s. And it basically says that no local municipality can try to pass any um, gun law or ordinance, if it's a city, um, that would be more stringent than the state law. So if we wanted to say, hey, we want to ban assault weapons, we couldn't do it. We'd get sued by the New Mexico Supreme Court. We could possibly go after ammunition because there's nothing that says anything about ammunition. So, you know, perhaps mat, um, large magazine clips. Um, in New Mexico, our numbers are, they're off the charts and how high they are. And the work, a lot of the work we do is with youth on the issue of gun violence. Last week, two teenagers were, um, they will be in wheelchairs for the rest of their lives because of gun violence. We lose uh, more than two children a month in this state to gun violence. We are the, have some of the highest numbers in the nation when it comes to gun violence per capita and when it comes to gun violence with our children. Um, our youth, sadly, um, it's very easy for them to get hold of firearms. I'm glad we passed the background check law and that will make a difference. But part of the problem is that a lot of these, these guns are being sold on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and it's very hard a lot of those guns are stolen. I think something that a local city could do, um, like Santa Fe, is really, and I was talking about this yesterday with the New Mexico Department of um, 
the injury death review team, because we, we were looking at numbers and what, how, what could we do because the numbers are going higher. Well, something we could do and we need to do is start a major public safety campaign to really get gun owners to lock up their guns, especially in cars. A lot of these guns are getting, getting stolen and ending up in the hands of youth um, because they're getting stolen out of cars. So to really get gun owners to, you know, try to convince gun owners to lock them up. I remember a few years ago, you had a bus poster <laughs> campaign, which said what, it's four in the afternoon, do you know where your gun is? Yeah, we actually, we were, we called ourselves a something gorilla uh, billboards or something, because we literally made it in my son's bedroom and I borrowed my friend's semi-automatic, we put on his nightstand. But it was an effective campaign because what we were trying to do is to, to show to parents, do you know, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Do you know where your gun is? Are you at work and did you not lock it up? Um, so, you know, that was a great, it was, that was a, I'd love that, that campaign. I'd love to do that again. Um, but really getting, you know, I know it sounds small, but getting guns locked up. We were very disheartened this last legislative session. We had the ERPO amendments and that those needed to pass. So we passed an, an ERPO law last year. That's an extreme risk protection order. A lot of people call it red flag. We don't do that. That stigmatizes people suffering from mental illness. And basically why I like this law is that it's about prevention. It's about preventing that moment when somebody could die by suicide with a firearm, when somebody could take that gun and shoot their whole family, right? It prevents that tragedy from happening. We had a simple amendment that was to make it possible for law enforcement and mental health practitioners to be able to petition to the judge to get the gun. Right now it's only family. And it sat on the house, it got through committees and sat in the house um, and then they threw it in how rules to die. I have no idea um, what the thinking was there because right now the, the law isn't working. We've taken in four, they've, they've been four extremist protection orders. So we hope that we can um, eventually get that passed. A lot of people say, well, there's no due process. It's not fair. Well, there is due process. The law enforcement goes to the judge or the family goes to law enforcement and law enforcement goes to the judge and says, this is what we're seeing. These are the facts. Do you think that, do you, what is your opinion on whether or not this should be an ERPO? So the judge is the one who makes that decision. That is due process. Um, it's passed in many states and we've seen great success in terms of reducing uh, suicide numbers. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with the the impulse of suicide with a, a gun that's available and is irrevocable once you once you do that. You and I have worked a little bit over the last couple of years on gun buyback programs. They're not a panacea, but they do provide heightened awareness. And I think the last time uh, there was a city collaboration with you, a couple of the guns that were turned in had been stolen and uh, got them off the street that way. So there's small steps, but ultimately at the end of the day, that's, that's not keeping up with the, the violence and the carnage that's taking place in all of our cities. Is, is Colorado now, at least at the state level from what you've tracked since Boulder, are they motivated to do something more dramatic when it comes to assault weapons or other steps? Uh, in I Colorado? Think, I think they're going to try. They have a great um, gun violence prevention group there called Ceasefire Colorado, who I know very well. They, they will try. Um, I, hope, I hope they can get it through. Um, but I will say, though, going back to the gun buybacks, I actually think gun buybacks are an extremely effective way to get rid of unwanted guns. When we did the, um, the Santa Fe gun buyback and back in September, um, we took in 192 guns. The majority of them majority were semi-automatic handguns and assault weapons. We took in four sawed off shotguns, right? That the police were just, they were so happy because you don't want those guns circulating. And um, we were happy to hear that the stolen guns had been stolen decades ago. So a lot of people say, well, if you do these gun buybacks, people are gonna go steal a gun to get their grocery card. You know, I'm rolling my eyes all the way to Texas. And so I'm glad that every time we do a gun buyback, we can say, no, they were stolen a long time ago. We did one in Las Cruces two weeks ago where we took in 101 guns. 
Um, again, 40, over 40 were semi-automatic handguns. We took in three assault weapons. One was stolen. It had been stolen years ago. And the poor man was, you know, he said, I, I bought this on Facebook. You know, like, don't worry. Here's your Albertson's gift card. See you later. And then they put it into evidence and be returned to its rightful owner. But I do think they're an effective way to get those unwanted guns out of home. So those, those are the ones that aren't being locked up and the ones that are forgotten about. And, you know, we were talking about um, the role that firearms play with, in suicide and in often family death and then self-inflicted uh, suicide. People like to think it's a, you either are in favor of um, common sense gun control measures or you're in favor of mental and behavioral health treatment. I'm in favor of both. I mean, I know that coming out of COVID, I hear this all the time. Uh, I have a biweekly meeting with community leaders of all parts of our community, including the mental and behavioral health providers. And the spike in stress and in anxiety and in um, domestic violence and in, and in suicide attempts is directly related, I think, to the year that we've been through. And people are under extraordinary pressure and extraordinary stress, and they need help. At the same time that we should provide more help, and there is, there is thankfully money in the, um, the bill that President Biden just signed into law. There's money for more behavioral and mental health treatment, thankfully. Uh, but we also need to recognize that if we have fewer guns in the wrong hands for the wrong reasons, we'll all, all be a lot safer. Our kids will be safer. Our community will be safer. So what, what we can do another gun buyback for sure. The city and you will collaborate on that. And it does get these things off the street and it does put grocery uh, coupons into people's hands because we've got hungry people who would rather be fed than have a gun. Well, that, yeah, that's why we started the Groceries for Guns program because we literally, we kept hearing, I don't need guns in my home right now with kids home, people depressed, but I do need groceries on the table. So we thought, well, let's change our guns to gardens to groceries for guns. And we give out Smith's, Albertson's, Target, Walmart cards, and people can go buy groceries and um, not worry about that firearm ever again. Yeah. Other things that you, and, and you've done your uh, mural programs with kids in our schools or out of our schools, but school age kids um, and uh, promises not to participate in bringing a gun to school or being a gun uh, person who, who carries a gun. Uh, what else, as we look at this on continuing onslaught where, where do we go? What, ha what can you recommend to ordinary, you know, people who might be watching or listening saying, okay, I'm not a state legislator. I don't get to vote on, on uh, these laws, but I care deeply. What, what can I do? I think that really going, the, why the majority of our programs are with youth is because they are the change. I mean, we've said that, we said that back in 2013. That's why we do so much work with youth. And we've seen, I mean, I have the best job in the world. I mean, I get to work with youth directly on this issue and I get to see, I get to see them change their mind. I get to see kids that are in gangs decide, you know what, this isn't helping my life, you know? So we, we are seeing that if we sit down and do these programs and these projects with these youth, that they, they will change their mind. Um, when we did the student pledge Hopefully we'll start again in, in, um, once COVID is, uh, is over. Um, when we were doing the student pledge against gun violence in all the schools around Northern New Mexico, uh, we saw a 54% reduction according to the Youth Resilience Survey of youth in those years we were doing it, bringing weapons to school. Now we can't say that's because of us, we can't prove that, but we take that win because nobody else is talking to them <laughs> about not bringing a gun to school. And it gives youth an opportunity to create event around gun violence prevention and talk to their peers about, hey, let's not do something stupid with firearms. Um, I, I find it really interesting when we talk, we, we speak in schools a lot and rural and urban on the importance of gun safety and locking up your guns. And what breaks my heart in school after school after school, after we do our presentation, um, sometimes I bring in a girl who she, um, accidentally shot and killed her boyfriend. And she goes and scares the, the middle school boys to never touch a gun. 
But what breaks my heart is that you hear in every classroom we go to repeatedly, the kids raising their hand and saying, do you have free gun locks? I want my parents to lock up their guns. They actually are afraid and angry that their parents aren't locking up their guns. You're <laughs> just going. So then we take guns to the school. They have to give them to the parent, not to the kid. You don't want a kid going home with a gun lock and trying to put it on themselves. Um, but I think it's really important that, you know, you say, what can people do? Get their friends to lock up their guns, get their friends to get rid of those guns they don't want. You know, I mean, if somebody is, is suffering from depression or substance abuse, dare to ask, I hate to use that phrase anymore um, because of the drug campaign, but you know, have the courage to ask. Um, it may not be the right time to have a gun in your home. You know, we are the number one state in the country when it comes to suicide and the majority are with a firearm. I mean, it's just, you know, and we're looking at now the CDC came out that usually we lose um, about 40,000 people a year to gun violence nationally. It's up this year to 44,000. And it's probably because of COVID and suicide, like you were saying. Yeah, I think that we, fo I focus a lot of my own attention on our numbers with COVID cases, but there's the other side of COVID cases, which has to do with the the emotional toll it's taking on people. And we can't minimize that. Frankly, I think, as you say, when we get COVID behind us, when everybody's vaccinated and we're feeling more confident, we may see things emotionally more social uh, distress than we did during COVID. People are strong and resilient and they're holding themselves together. And then when they feel like COVID is behind us, I think we'll see a lot of folks finally letting their guard down and we're gonna need major emotional support and mental and behavioral health support as we confront the next wave, which will be an emotional wave as opposed to a COVID-19 wave. That, that I, I'm, not, I'm not making that up. I think there are a lot of people who are watching the, the way these issues ripple through people and through our culture, through our society. We're tough. And then when we can afford not to be quite so tough, it sets in just how hard we've been working to keep ourselves together. So it is a good time to get guns out of, out of uh, the wrong hands and lock them up. If you have a gun, put it in a safe, put a, a gun lock on it if you don't need it. You don't have to have a gun buyback program to turn in a gun you don't want anymore. You can turn it in. Ken, you, am I wrong on that? You made a face. I guess I'm wrong. <laughs> well, sadly, I mean, some police departments will take them. There's a ridiculous law on our New Mexico books that says that if a gun goes into law enforcement, goes, they take possession of it, they have to get a court order of approval to destroy it. And then you have a historian come in and make sure that it is not a historic relic. It makes it very difficult. We actually the police department gives our number. We go pick them up and chop them up for them. We will really do that. Somebody has a gun they don't want, call, you know, call us to go to our website, you know, New Mexicans to prevent gun violence, email us and we go take it, make sure it's not loaded, dismantle it right there. And then they don't have to worry about it. Okay, much better, much better advice than mine. So <laughs> give, us, give us the URL for, the, uh, for that website. So it's um, just www.newmexicans to prevent gun violence.org. You can email us, you can call us. Email is better. And um, also, if you need a gun lock, we have uh, California certified gun locks. We will give those to you for free. We will drive them to your house and hand them to you. We will put them in your mailbox. We will, you know, anything you need, we will do it. Um, we've done it before. I've driven all over New Mexico picking up guns. A lot of times, somebody is just, um, they're not doing well and they know it's not the right time to have a gun and they don't know what to do with it. Great, great. Any, any last thoughts, Marina? Thank you for being here today. I, this is, you know, you and I have been talking about this for a long time with each other and we know the state law that we can't, or the constitutional law, the constitutional requirement that the city of Santa Fe can't do anything more uh, than what the state provides for, and you've been working in the legislature trying incrementally to make gains. What's the, what, what do you think, where do we go from here? And what would you say as a closing thought for folks about what happened this last week? I think it, it's a, 
it's it's tragic and our our washington legislators need to they need to step up to the plate um especially with the assault weapons ban that needs to happen on a federal level we know in 19 when did it end in 2004 that's when you saw an uptick in these shootings where people were using assault weapons we they, it's the it's the weapon of choice for a for a, for a shooting i knew when i was watching boulder unfold when you don't see ambulances leaving you know it was an assault weapon because they are so lethal you know that nobody survived that um and i think it's it's tragic you know and we need to get you know there's a there's a lot of very responsible gun owners out there um especially our hunter and, and ranching communities we need them to be loud and clear that they don't want this happening um that they don't want assault weapons that they don't you know we need to really really you know elevate their voice because you know, maybe people will listen to them. They don't always listen to me. <laughs> no, good. You're right. I mean, they're, uh, responsible gun ownership is not a made up thing. It's for real. You can, okay. you, you can, you can be a responsible gun owner. You can be a hunter. You can be somebody who loves the outdoors and not be in favor of assault weapons being uh, uh, um, used on other human beings in uh, supermarkets and schools and uh, churches and synagogues, uh, they're, they're not the same thing. Right. No, it's true. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you. Appreciate your coming on the webcast. And I, uh, I hope you continue to make progress on this. It's really important for New Mexico. We will. We're not giving up. All right. Thank you. <laughs> See you, Joe. All right. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye. So folks, that's, uh, that was the news of the week last week. We had really bad, uh, tragic events, uh, but uh, we also had some good news. And to talk about some of the good news is Dr. Wendy Johnson from La Familia, our favorite public health advocate and uh, our, our uh, guru on all things COVID. How are you doing, Dr. Johnson? Doing okay. I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, a little trepidatious that we went to Turquoise yesterday or Tur uh, Wednesday rather. Tur I know a lot of people are very excited about that. Um, yeah. I, I thought the rule was we needed to be green for a month, but I guess not. So um, I guess I got that wrong. So uh, so here we are, almost open. We are in in uh, Turquoise, which we all think is a beautiful color. I have some. I know that as a person who does this for a living, you sit, you always remind me, don't look at the day-to-day -day data. Those are not really that critical. You have to look at the top, you know, the seven, 10 day trend. Yeah. But I'm looking back uh, to the 21st of this month, seven, two, six, then nine, 10. So we're floating in that area of new cases. The, the most important thing for me is the, the foot race we're in between vaccinations and variants. Right. And the vaccinations are really opening up. I mean, this week, um, theoretically, they opened up eligibility to almost everybody except for totally healthy people between 16 and 60. Right. But if you have a chronic illness, if you're over 60, if you're an essential worker, really any kind of essential worker that can't work from home, um, but especially the kind of frontline essential workers that we really need for just, you know, to eat and to drink and all of that. So if you're working in any kind of service industry, um, that's essential grocery stores, healthcare, um, you know, any kind of retail hardware stores that we need to have open to function um then uh that's the top line kind of front line with what's called frontline essential workers and then um all the other people that basically need to be in person for their job um fall into the other category but it's all open um the other exciting thing that just uh, was announced i think today is that over 75 year olds can now um go to sign up for an appointment without an event code Oh, wow. so you don't have to wait to get called. You just go onto the website and you can sign up for an appointment without an event code. Haven't tested it, not sure how it works. Um, you might want to, if you're having problems with this technology again, might want to call. 
the Department of Health phone number and get help with that. But that was just announced today. So um, I know there's more and more places in the state that are talking about soon, maybe I, Christus is one of them here in Santa Fe doing drive up clinics. Um, I know that we, we're still focusing on our patients at La Familia, um, but I know that there are other clinics in town where, where as long as you have a, a registration number from the Department of Health, um, you, you can call and make an appointment. Like I've heard the Pecos Clinic is doing that. So, um, and is then that, our surrounding states have opened up to almost everybody, so. So does that, is that an indication that we're getting more vaccine? And so now not only can more people get put through the, the vaccination process, but you can do it on a more open basis. You don't have to have that code showing up in your uh, smartphone or whatever. Right, as far as I know, the only people that can register right now without having that code is the over 70, that can get an appointment rather, is the over 75 year olds um, with the Department of Health. I'm not sure about the Pecos Clinic, you'll have to, you have to call them, but either of those places, of course, the, the prerequisite is you do have to be registered with the Department of Health. So that's the number one most important thing for everybody to do who wants the vaccine, yes. register with the Department of Health. But you know, we're doing great. We're still in the top one or two or three states in the country, depending on when, what, when you look and what website you look at. And um, you know, there was some critique because they're on the CDC site, they, they parse it by over 65 year olds. And we were a little bit down on the list for the percent of our over 65. But I think that's really because we were focusing on the over 75 for so long. And while the, a lot of states opened it up to over 60, over 65, but as an overall percentage of our population, as the number of vaccines that we're getting out the door, all of those measures, you know, we're in the top one, two, three states in the country. So we have to be really proud of that. And I think I've got the vaccine dashboard numbers as of yesterday. Anybody, you know, the good, one of the things the state I think is doing a really nice job in addition to getting everybody or as many people registered as possible is letting us know what the numbers look like so we can keep track. Uh, as of yesterday, 37% of Santa Fe County had gotten at least one shot. 20.5% uh, had been fully vaccinated. So a fifth of our folks. And then 62.8% have registered. Now that's good news, bad news. We needed that other 38% to get motivated. And if it's too hard, use the phone. If the phone's too hard, find somebody to help because uh, there are outreach helpers who can get you through the process to get registered. But if we get up into the 70 and 80% of people who are registered and the vaccine continues to arrive and the hospitals do an amazing job, the outlets are doing a great job of bringing people through and getting the medicine into people's arms. I think that's that's what we need. I, I went last Saturday, I got a call that I was, my my registration number was up uh, and uh, in a good way. Yeah. Uh, usually when you say your number's up, that's not always a good way. But in this case, I'd waited and waited for, for the signal. And I was told show up at uh, 8.30 or whatever the time was and be at Christus. And it was smooth and the volunteers were great. And the Spirit was very, very optimistic. People were glad to be there getting their vaccination. People observed social distance, waiting in line with masks on. Uh, and I can tell you that the, it, it works. You know, when you register and they call you and you go, it is a very smooth process and uh, it gets people protected you will find it, it uh, changes the trajectory of our county and our state. What, yeah. what, do you know, what do you know about the equity piece, Dr. Johnson? Because you raised that issue right. a month or so ago. I mean, I think that the, in response to that, the state came out with an equity plan. They looked at the counties where they said the equity was worse or that had more rural population or lower percentages. And they preferentially tried to boost vaccinations in those counties um, for that equity plan. Um, you know, we at La Familia, our biggest zip code is that 87507 zip code, which both has a great burden of cases, has had throughout the pandemic. 
and is the place you know it has lower income, um, more Hispanic, more immigrant population in that zip code. So our greatest number of, of, uh, of patients are from that zip code. So um, with our effort, you know, we're, we're focusing on really all of our patients, but since most of them are from that zip code, a lot from that zip code. And so, um, and a lot of uninsured folks too come to La Familia. So I think, you know, one thing that the New Mexico state has done really well around this equity issue is really pushed out the vaccine to a lot of federally qualified health centers, community clinics all over the state. Um, so that, you know, and, and we see those most vulnerable populations. So a lot of states haven't done that. That's why they did the federal partnership with the federally qualified health centers, the community clinics. And, and really, although some community clinics are participating in that federal partnership, we, we aren't yet because we get a much better deal from the state. You know, we're getting a lot of vaccine from the state. We've got a really good reporting rapport with the state. It's hard for us to have, you know, two different streams. So um, I think the state's been great about looking at those entities, those institutions that can really get the vaccine out the door equitably. And then their own operation has been amazing. Yeah, they've done a nice job on that too. Um, talk a little bit about um, testing. Do we still need, is testing, it's kind of, when the vaccination process started, we stopped talking, or I, I confess I stopped talking as much about testing, 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 it's really important, get tested, get the free test, the tube you can uh, spit into, send it in, Vault Health, it's free, kind of fell off the radar screen because we're trying to get people to register to get vaccinated. Yeah. Uh, as we open up, as, and we're all very happy to be in turquoise, as we open up, it seems to me testing is important. Testing is so important, you know, as we have fewer cases, as we continue to want to open, we don't want to see our testing percents go up so high because that means we're missing cases. So a um, few things about testing. One, it's not impossible. Remember these vaccines, especially just the first dose, number of people, patients, anecdotal, you know, friends, family that I've heard of have uh, gotten sort of COVID days after they got the first vaccine or, you know, a week after or something like that maybe already had it when they got the vaccine and just didn't know it. So I think that especially if you get symptoms within the first couple of weeks of getting your first dose, definitely don't hesitate, even if it's just a sore throat or just a runny nose, um, still, or definitely if you're not vaccinated, anyone who has symptoms should, should go get tested. I've had also a lot of situation where a lot of calls about, oh, you know, we were at our cousin's house over the weekend and just found out that our uncle tested positive. So, um, and you know, not all the family was vaccinated or none of them were vaccinated. So need to treat that just the same way as we treated it before the vaccines. If you're not vaccinated and you have contact with a positive person, you need to isolate. And it's a really good idea in that situation to get tested about seven to 10 days after the contact. Don't get tested too early. Um, and, and then if you're vaccinated and you get uh, really classic symptoms like, you know, the fever, the loss of taste and smell, a big flu-like illness, uh, definitely also get tested because um, even though the vaccine is good at preventing serious disease and hopefully you won't get hospitalized, it's not 100% and you could still have COVID and you still, even if you're vaccinated, if you test positive or even if you get really um, typical symptoms, you want to self-isolate, you know, you don't want to be around other people and potentially pass it to other people, vaccinated or not. Right, right. Yeah. All right, coming attractions. What, what's in the week ahead, doctor? What do, what do we need to be aware of? Well, to, what's, what do we do to stay in turquoise? How do we not let this go to our head and suddenly take off our mask yeah. and everybody, let's go out to dinner. Let's just you know, forget about COVID. I, I mean, it, hopefully it'll get warm here in the next week. I think it's supposed to get a little warmer. So again, you know, if you're gonna go out, if you're gonna gather with friends, try to do it outside. Outside is pretty darn safe, okay? Not a hundred, nothing's a hundred percent, but if you do it outside, if you ma maintain the distancing, um, it's really great. I know a lot of people are sort of gearing up for the school start and, and thinking about that. 
Um, I know there was a big push to vaccinate all the school workers. So if you're a school worker and you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, call the Department of Health, call your primary care doctor, call Christus. I'm sure you're gonna find somebody to get you vaccinated right away. But as school opens, that's gonna be another risk. And we wanna make sure all the workers are really vaccinated. And if you have questions about the vaccine, if you're like, well, I'm a teacher, but I don't know, I feel like maybe you have a, a autoimmune disease or maybe you have a special situation. Maybe you have strong allergic reactions to certain things. If you have any question about it, please, please, please talk to your primary care doctor um, and, uh, and, and talk to them about that. Because in almost all situations, you might be pregnant, for example, in almost all those situations, there's very little contraindications. These vaccines are extremely safe, so extremely safe. There's been just very few episodes of even the anaphylactic shock that we talk about, the extreme allergic reactions. Amongst millions, there's been you know, kind of less than a handful um, or a few handfuls um, for both Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines of any kind of strong reaction like that. And no deaths really attributed to those because they're easy to treat if you're watching for them. So if you have hesitancy, and especially if you're an essential worker, or if you're especially a school worker, you know, talk to your primary care doctor because it's really probably a good, good idea both for you and the community to get vaccinated if you're going to be going back to work now. And I know a lot of people are. Yeah. And the good news is we're reopening. That's phenomenal. It feels, yeah. it feels the timing is good. We've got weather coming. Uh, we're getting some federal dollars to help uh, keep the recovery going economically uh, and socially. Uh, the city's got some money to put into sprucing up our city and taking care of the parks and the medians and downtown. And, and I think we're ready to come out of hyper, a long year of hibernation and quarantine. At the same time, we can't throw caution to the wind. We've got to be vigilant. We've got to acknowledge there are these variants out there that have they've really caused major problems back uh, with people closing back down in countries in Europe yeah. uh, and major illnesses. It's not just, are you open or are you closed? It's how are people doing with this next round of uh, the variants? And you've got a, a large spike in cases, people being hospitalized again. It, it's not like we've got COVID licked. We are doing better and we've got vaccine that is now beginning to really come through the process, uh, but it's not in everybody's arm yet. It hasn't yeah. been delivered yet. So it's a little bit of a, a not, you know, you think about the, the, you'd like it to all be one way where we can open and be confident. And we should be glad we're opening, but we also have to be vigilant that we don't fall prey to another round of, uh, of a variant coming into New Mexico and putting us back on our heels. It, it, it is still a uh, very, very tenuous situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we just have to look to places like Brazil and Chile and Germany and Italy. Um, there's a lot of countries, you know, developed and lesser developed countries that uh, they haven't gotten the vaccine out very fast. They haven't done really effective lockdowns. and they've seen cases surge again. And a lot of deaths, I mean, Brazil is kind of out of control and really dire situation. And, you know, we have some states, I think last week when I looked, there are 23 states in the country that are experiencing surges right now. New Mexico luckily is not one of them. But, um, you know, we, if again, really simple to wear a mask, really simple if you're gonna do a social thing to opt for doing it outside. We can open and we can keep ourselves safe. Safe, so open let's remember together. that. Safe, open together. That's the Santa Fe promise. Yeah, exactly. All right, Dr. Johnson, it's so good to see you. I will probably see you if you're downtown this weekend. I was uh, on the plaza on Saturday, just looking to see how we were doing. We were getting a positive uh, group of people, very active, almost everybody wearing masks, except when they're eating an ice cream cone. Uh, and the merchants were smiling. The the downtown folks were out for a walk. People were enjoying the, the, the Saturday weather. And so I'll probably see you again this, if you're downtown this weekend, I'll wave at you. 
I have my acequia cleaning tomorrow, so oh, I will not. I'm busy tomorrow, uh, but but maybe on Sunday. And maybe I, on Sunday. I, yeah, I'll see you. Thanks. Bye, Thank everybody. You, Dr. Johnson. Nice to see you again. Well, that is good advice from our uh, local public health, my go-to public health person, Dr. Wendy Johnson from La Familia. She's with us almost every Friday. Well, that is uh, today's wrap up. Um, we talked about the tragedies in Atlanta and in Boulder and the need to be alert to the issue of uh, gun violence in our own community and appreciate Miranda Viscoli being with us. An update from Dr. Wendy Johnson on where we stand with vaccinations. We should still get uh, get tested if you think you might be uh, exhibiting the symptoms of COVID. Wear your mask, stay socially distant, go outdoors when you can. But remember to shop local, take care of our merchants as they reopen. Uh, go to your favorite restaurant now. We're in the turquoise area and as long as we are appropriately careful, we can begin to enjoy the beauty and the the joy and the specialness of being in Santa Fe in spring and summer. So have a good weekend, enjoy yourself. I've got my mask for this weekend, I'll be wearing it. I'll probably see you downtown on the plaza or maybe at a restaurant over on the south side. Until uh, I see you next week, please stay safe, take care of yourself, take care of your family, take care of our community. Together we will all take care of this special place we get to call home Santa Fe. I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye, everybody.